underneath my shirt and said, so does this mean you're getting ready for another trip to Hawaii? <laughs> nope. Just wearing this shirt so that uh, I can prove a point about we need to watch all of our tongues for what we're saying and everything, because even idle words can be taken out of context. This week I heard a million times, and I was asked a million different ways, and I'm exaggerating on a million, of course, about what we were doing out in the foyer because the table got moved. I don't know why the table got moved. I didn't move it. How's that? You'd have to ask the person who did. No, no fingers being pointed. I think I know who did. I don't have any real reason to know why because I didn't ask them. But I got asked a million times, even to the point where, are we having a coffee bar put out in the lobby? <laughs> so I'm like, you know, this needs to be something that I talk about, even if it's not a sermon, that how things can change. And that scripture came to mind, you know, that's what we're here to worship. We're here to give the best of what we have to God because God gave His best, His only Son for us. And the people that were worshiping back then, all they knew was there was going to be a promise of a Savior. If you're reading your readings that I put down last week, and here's the little books. If you want to join along, yeah, you've got to play catch up. Life is hard. Ooh. It's going to take you about 10 to 15 minutes per day to read to get caught up. So it'll take you a couple hours out of your time if you have it. There's no excuse not to dig into this. But here is the chronological reading of the Bible mapped out for 2019. You start, as you saw last week in the bulletin, with Genesis 1 to 3. By the end of day 3, you're through Genesis chapter 11. Then you skip over to Job to read this cosmic Game story. Yes, I use the word game. You can crucify me for it or say that's fine to use that. Because when you read it, you'll see all these things and you'll agree with these people, but then you'll see their hypocrisy in the things that they say and how far their wisdom really is from God. Because who are we to say how God should act or behave as mere human beings? But praise be to God that He acts and behaves exactly as His character is always has been, always will be, so that we can be confident in our hope. And today we're going to read Colossians, a letter to the church that Paul wrote to a church he'd never even seen, but he writes this letter to encourage them about their faith. Because people are telling them in that day and age, you don't worship the way we do, you don't do it right. <laughs> wow. So we'll get into that letter in just a little bit. And I don't have my Bible up here today to prove a point too. I'm just full of points today. <laughs> but if you want to read in this, let me get back to that, then you should be getting to the point where I think tomorrow you see God's answer to Job and to all the other people. So it's basically each day with a little space below it where you can journalize. I challenge you to write a thought that stuck out to you from Scripture or a prayer request or whatever it is. And if you'll take 10 to 15 minutes a day, more if you study it, more whatever, but I encourage you to read it first, study it, digest it later. Make sure you get the reading done first. Then you can read the Bible through in a year. You can go faster if you want to. When you start reading Job, if you read it and you really want to learn and digest it, the words will jump off the page. That's what God's do Word does. It says it's alive. It's sharp. It cuts double-edged sword. So it cuts when it goes in, it cuts when it pulls out. Cuts to the core, dividing soul and spirit. Because God Himself has written down His words in the Bible. And Jesus Christ lived them out in the flesh. So that we could understand who God is by studying His Word and relying on His Spirit. So if you do that, then you can journalize and hear and everything. I tend to get going ahead because I get excited. And I say, what's this next guy going to say in Job? And then Sherry's like, I'm reading this with you. Don't work ahead. And then I'm like, oh, yep, you're right. I'm praising God that my wife is going along with this. Why would I want to go ahead of her? That just is silly. So then if I'm hungering and thirsting and reading the Word and devouring the bread and the living water, I go read something else. So I read Colossians the other night. And I go, i got to share this with the church. So we're going to read Colossians today. The whole book. It's not a book. It's a letter. It's a letter written to a church meant to read out loud when they gather together. Because something they're facing in the world today. 
like chit chat because I wear a Superman shirt or a Hawaiian shirt or a credenza table is in a different place. <gasps> Be careful. If your heart is right, it won't matter. If your heart is right, it won't matter if you say, hey, he's going to Hawaii again. Praise God for that. I'm not, by the way. <laughs> so, I have my phone today. Uh-oh. Uh-oh, that's disrespectful, is it? Do you know that I have the NIV Bible on here, the King James Bible, the AMP Bible, the NLT Bible, the ASV Bible, the ESV Bible, and this weekend they're on sale and I'm going to buy some more because there's a lot of different ones that are $1.99 or 99 cents. Go buy a Bible for that in print. And I have them all here so that I can look and compare. And I have concordances on here and study helps. This is with me wherever I go. I'd like to say that all of you have a printed copy of God's Word wherever you go. And I'd also like to say there is a command that says thou shalt not lie, right? Okay? But most people carry their phone so that they can get in contact with their wife and everything. At least you maybe should because it's just the thing to do. I remember the days when we didn't, where I was on the road when we first moved out here and I had to get a phone card and stop and call every once in a while, let her know I made it through Wyoming all right because there's plenty of distances there between there's nothing for a hundred miles. And you better check your fuel gauge because only by God's grace have I made it to the next towns in some of those because you hit a headwind going up and down those hills and you don't realize it and you're pulling a load cross country and you were getting six miles a gallon and all of a sudden you're getting three. So the fuel that you thought was going to pull you to the next town, when you pull in there, you're like, thank you, Lord, and I made it. Because <laughs> he's with us. He'll never forsake us. So anyway, I am using my phone because that's what I do. And I was in bed one night when I read Colossians off of my phone. And I said, well, you know what? I'm just going to type out my sermon on this phone, at least an introduction. Okay. So here is what I wrote, and I'm going to read it to you, because you know it doesn't matter if we read it, because that's what the letter from Paul was. Oh, well, somebody shouldn't just get up here and read. Who says? Who says you can't do that? Mike, now you can preach again. Hey, <laughs> I just gave you the go-ahead. So I titled it, A Colossal Mistake, because we're right, reading the letter to Colossians, get it? It would be a colossal mistake if you read this letter and don't let it pierce your mind and your heart to repentance. The movie that we're going to see is Born Again by Chuck Colson. Or not by Chuck Colson, it's about Chuck Colson. Who was the hatchet man for Richard Nixon and he went to prison for scandalous things. In prison, he found Jesus. And everybody said, I don't know about that. Sounds like a ploy to get out of prison. I don't know if you know it or not, but there's a law and he was offered it by a fellow senator or a House of Representatives, I don't know who he was so I don't want to say that wrong, that said, hey, I'll serve your term for you because I can legally do that and you can get out. And he said, nope, I need to serve my term. And after he came out, skeptical by his family and everything else, he basically single-handedly then did a prison ministry. And if you're familiar with angels, something, I don't know what it's called, you might know, he started that ministry and many others. He's dead and gone now. He's with Jesus. But one man can make a difference when they live a life, and the scriptures are full of these examples, when they live a life sold out to God, giving Him your best. You are a new creation in Christ. The old is gone. Don't keep holding on to it. So I'm going to read from my phone, from the pulpit. <laughs> Our scripture reading this morning was 2 Chronicles 15, 11 through 15. They took their oath seriously. They really, really came together to worship. Kind of makes our worship look pitiful. And they never knew of Jesus. They only had hope that a Savior would come. How then should we come together and worship God with all that we have in Jesus? The church is God's people called together to proclaim the message of salvation through Jesus Christ. The joyful hope that we have. We gather here. Ah, oh, the Colossians didn't gather in a temple or building. They gathered in someone's home. I've heard today that we should go back to those things. Well, is that the right motivation behind that or is that a scapegoat answer? Are you wanting to say you want to go back to that because you don't like the other people you're around so you want to get the few you like and have in your home? Then that's the wrong reason. 
If you're being persecuted, which they were, didn't have a building to meet in, if you met out in public, you'd probably be drug away and, and killed, then the idea of meeting in a home might have been the thing to do. And they still were bold. Go read Acts. Just the first four chapters, you can do that today. And look at the example of the first church. In Acts chapter 2, you'll see the Holy Spirit moving. You'll see what the believers say. At the end of Acts chapter 4, you'll see they pray for boldness again. And you'll see mighty works being done. Even the point that these crazy individuals sold out for Jesus, Jesus freaks, whatever you want to call them, said, we'll go sell everything we have and just take care of each other's needs. Now, I've read that and read that and I read that again this week. And I said, that's a neat concept. I used to think that I don't like that concept. I worked hard for my stuff. But then the Holy Spirit came up on me and said, you wouldn't have it if I didn't give you the abilities to do it and bless you with it. Each and every morning you wake up, you better thank me for having oxygen, let alone your health, because you could do nothing without me. So you get a little different viewpoint then. But when I was reading it this time, I was like, wow. I've always read that God added to their numbers daily. That means... He added to their wealth and prosperity also. Because when it started out, it was a small community of believers, whatever it was, to then 5,000. The physical things they had, the money, the food, the clothing, was the same, right? They didn't go out and get other jobs and stuff. Instead, in fact, they spent themselves daily meeting together, praying, um, singing psalms, and so forth. So where did all the extra abundance to take care of all these extra people that were coming in came from? <laughs> from a mighty, wonderful God that supplies it all in the first place. Right? So as you read, the new things come out because Scripture says it's living. And when you read it again, God will speak more and more to you if you go to Him seeking Him with all your heart. Not with some, not as a tedious task. So if you want one of these, come get one. I'll order more if I need to. I didn't order enough for everybody in here because I didn't expect everyone to commit. Not to point fingers, but if you want to commit, commit reading. And then you can help me commit. Like I said before, you can say, are you where you're supposed to be, Alan? And I'll say yes or no. Because that's what we're supposed to do with each other. We're supposed to train each other up, be accountable. We're all parts of the body as we're learning in Corinthians. We all have a part that's given to us by the Spirit of God for His purpose and will to build up the body of Christ so that we can tell the world. So, how do you do church? How do you do church? I'm not using the word in the right way. I mean playing at church, going to church, whatever you want to say. Because church isn't what it used to be. I explained that. In the early church, it was coming together for safety, security, learning, everything else. What reasons do you go to church? Many Christians today in the United States, which we're looked at totally differently than other places in the world, how we do church, go simply to get out of church what they can get out of it. That's not what my body parts do. My body parts benefit my body, as Paul explains, because my mind tells my body what to do. And the head of the church, you and I, is Jesus Christ. So how do you do church? I'll remind you again that church is a group of people called out to worship and proclaim God. We're going to read Colossians today. It would be a colossal mistake to not hear this letter and apply it to our lives. Last week I read scripture from a letter that Paul wrote to a church in Thessalonica. This week I'm going to read the letter to the church at Colossae. I want you to think about your life and service to Christ, especially to His body, which is the church. Before I, want to start, before I start, I want to point out and even emphasize that we are all, all to love the Lord our God with all. Jesus says this was the first and greatest commandment, which will lead to the second commandment, to love one another. Remember that when we're reading that letter. This is the most important thing for people to do. But remember that we worship God in different ways, and that is okay. They especially don't have to do it the way that you prefer, or even the way that you want them to. Like music, for example. Paul points these differences out in his letter, and that different is okay, as long as these people are first focusing, focusing on worshiping God. People are telling the believers in Colossae that they are doing church in the wrong way. Just because it isn't our way doesn't mean it's wrong. Remember this. Paul even tells them that keeping the Sabbath or any other religious day is not important. That's one of the ten, right? 
What is important is what Paul is writing. Jesus even said, I'm Lord of the Sabbath, and healed on that day to create controversy to the ones who thought they practiced church in the right way. Okay? What is important, what Paul was saying, is to love Jesus because of who He is and what He's done for you. Love Him with all of your heart, mind, soul, and body. So is He Lord of your life? As Jesus grows this church, changes will come. And all of us need to be careful that we don't stand in the way of Jesus building His church. One way that we've seen dramatic change is the smartphone. The only reason I carry, ooh, I wrote this down so I'd say it right, a printed copy of the Bible to church, in quotations, is because some of you would frown on me if I did not. All my Bible does is hold a copy of my bulletin and any other notes. Guess what? I can do that too. I don't even need my Bible for that. My printed copy. And I'm not being blasphemous. There's my bulletin. See? So the phone can even literally hold my bulletin. <laughs> That's funny. Laugh. My phone can do all these things, so it's not wrong if I am using them. It's just the method that I am using them. And I have all this information at my fingertips. Is it wrong? No, it's just different. But it's not wrong. To me, it's invaluable. Most of the time, even more than calls, texts, and internet for personal reason, if you see me using my phone, it's for countless Bible translation and commentaries. Yesterday I went to the VBS day, and I didn't have a lot to do there. So I read my three chapters or four chapters of Job there on my phone and highlighted and made notes. These vast resources that we have have not been literally in the palm of our hand until the smartphone. Sure, with it comes the ability to be distracted. I could have searched porn and other things, okay? But don't condemn anyone for being different in church. Many pastors today even use apps and sermon notes for people to use and follow along with their, firm, their sermon. And most, get this, giving, tithing, offering, whatever you want to say, nowadays is given by computer or phone. Hmm, we don't even have that available in this church. Think about this. Someone's Jacob's age, he has a checkbook. There's no one else in here that age I can pick on. Sorry, Jacob. I was going to use Joy and Cameron. I don't know what they have. He doesn't use a check. He does use a check here at the church, and that's the only place you write a check. Is that not correct? Only place. He only has a checkbook to write a check to church. Otherwise, he would just hit the donate button now. And do you not donate to godly causes feel led by your phone? More than one? Because he's had that donate now button as he's been going along. I'm not saying we're going to do that. That's not what I'm saying. That's not where this leads to social gossip. We might. I'm giving you an example. Okay? It's been proven that it promotes better giving because when the Spirit calls, I can give. Okay? Think about it this way. Churches from yesterday used to say the printed Word of God was a bad thing. The printing press was a terrible thing. From this printing press was going to be pornography and all kind of works against God and everything else. But there's also God's written Word that came across the printing press. And God is God and can handle all the other things, not you. You're called to be His witness, His hands and feet. I was laying, at bed, laying in bed when I wrote this. God could be calling me to give to my church, and I could if we had a button for it. It was the church who for decades tried to stop the written Word of God. This introduction was entirely typed out on my phone in my bed and is now being read to you. Imagine that. Now grab whatever translation and whatever format of your Bible preferences you want and turn to the book of Colossians. I'm going to read... NLT. As you're getting there, I want to read a few verses leading us up to it. You're not quite here yet, but you'll be here in Job in a day or two. Job 42, 1 to 6. Job replied to the Lord, I know that you can do anything and no one can stop you. You asked, who is that that questions my wisdom with such ignorance? It is I. 
And I was talking about things I knew nothing about, things far too wonderful for me. You said, listen, and I will speak. I have some questions for you, and you must answer them. I had only heard about you before. That's the reason of this battle. I'm giving you the kind of the spoiler alert here. God is God. The fact that He even associates Himself with a people, whether it's the nation of Israel or the church, is amazing and mighty and wonderful. How do we worship Him in result? I take back everything I said, verse 6, and I sit in dust and ashes to show my repentance. Solomon was given all the wisdom and wealth of the world and everything so that God knew what He would do with it. He didn't make a mistake so He could write Ecclesiastes and say, whoa, it's all meaningless. I've had everything this world can offer and it's meaningless. And He told young people, He said, young people, it's wonderful to be young. Enjoy every minute of it. Do everything you want to do. Take it all in. But, complete opposite, Remember that you must give an account to God for everything you do. So refuse to worry and keep your body healthy. But remember that youth with a whole life before you is meaningless. Don't let the excitement of youth cause you to forget your Creator. Honor Him in your youth before you grow old and say life is not pleasant anymore. Remember Him before light, for the light of the sun, moon, and stars is dim to your old eyes and rain, clouds continue, and rain clouds continually darken your sky. Take the most of every breath you have to praise the Lord. And in Matthew 13, Jesus said these words, replying to that parable of the sower who went to sow his seed. He replied in verse 11, You are permitted to understand the secrets of the kingdom of heaven. Permitted. But others are not. To those who listen to my teaching, more understanding will be given and they will have an abundance of knowledge. But for those who are not listening, even what little understanding they have will be taken away from them. That is why I, I use these parables. For they look, but they do not really see. They hear, but they do not really listen or understand. This fulfills the prophecy of Isaiah that says, When you hear what I say, you will not understand. When you see what I do, you will not comprehend. For the hearts of these people are hardened. God hardened them. They hardened them themselves, and then God did, so they could not. And they have closed their eyes, so their eyes cannot see, and their ears cannot hear, and their hearts cannot understand. So you better listen while you can. And they cannot turn to me, and let me heal them. But blessed are your eyes because they see and your ears because they hear. I tell you the truth, many prophets and righteous people long to see what you see, but they did not see it. And they long to hear what you hear, but they did not hear it. That's why I had us read what some of the people in the Old Testament did, what seemed extravagant, that they stopped what they did and they worshiped and thanked God for what they had. They didn't think that they were giving something up by sacrificing these animals or anything. They thought they were just giving God credit for being God. So saying that, let's read the letter to, of Colossians. Again, this is a letter me meant to be read to the church. Here's how it starts in Colossians 1. This letter is from Paul, chosen by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus and from our brother Timothy. We are writing to God's holy people in the city of Colossae who are faithful brothers and sisters. I just want to emphasize faithful there. Not just brothers and sisters, but Paul put in faithful. And because of that, may our God give you grace and peace. We always pray for you. And we give thanks to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. For we have heard of your faith again in Christ Jesus and what? Second thing, your love for all of God's people. You can say whatever you want to say, but if a church is obedient, God-fearing, everything else, which Paul is just getting to where we're at in Corinthians, ironically, if I had all these gifts of tongues and could speak with eloquence of angels, what would I be if I didn't have love? Ha! Ah, let me read it. For we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and your love for all of God's people. Which comes, this comes from your confident hope that you have. Because you know where your eternity will be. Which comes from your confident hope of what God has reserved for you in heaven. You have had this expectation ever since you first heard the truth of the good news. 
This same good news that came to you is going out all over the world. The purpose of gathering together to be equipped to proclaim the Word of God. It is bearing fruit. Jesus says you'll know them by their fruit. It's bearing fruit everywhere. How do I know this? Because it's changing lives just as it changed your life. You can't be a Christian and not be changed. You're a new creation in Christ. Just as it changed your lives from the day you first heard and understood the truth about God's wonderful, wonderful, wonderful grace. You learned about the good news from Epaphras, our beloved co-worker. He is Christ's faithful servant and he is helping us on your behalf. He has told us about the love that you have for others, that the Holy Spirit has given you. It's a gift from God. So we have not stopped praying for you since we have heard about you. We ask God to give you complete knowledge of His will and to give you spiritual wisdom and understanding. Then the way you live will always honor and please the Lord and your lives will produce every kind of good fruit. All the while you will grow as you learn to know God better and better. Sounds like a wonderful thing, doesn't it? Is that happening in your lives in your church? We also pray that you will be strengthened with all His glorious power so you will have endurance and patience you need. It won't be easy. You're called to suffer as your Lord and Savior suffered. May you be filled with joy even in those times. Always thanking the Father, He has enabled you to share in the inheritance that belongs to His people who live in the light. Remember when we stopped at John 12? Children wouldn't come out of the darkness into the light. And Jesus said, come into the light while you have the light. But in the first of John, it says that men love their wicked deeds more than they did and didn't want them to be exposed. But God has called us to be children of light. Verse 13, for He has rescued us from the kingdom of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of His dear Son, who purchased our freedom and forgave our sins. Now we're changing tune a little bit. Here's why. Paul's going to go into who Christ is. Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. You cannot know God without knowing Jesus. You can't know Jesus unless you're born again and the Holy Spirit reveals it to you. And if you know that, it will be evident in your love for one another and the fruit you produce. Verse 15, He existed before anything was created and is supreme over all creation, including Alan. <laughs> And through Him, God created everything in the heavenly realms and on earth. He made the things we can see and the things we can't see, such as thrones, kingdoms, rulers, and authorities of the unseen world. We don't have any idea what He's talking about, and we don't need to know. We just need to know that God brings glory in everything He does, even to the heavenly realms, which we can't fathom. <clears throat> what verse was I on? Okay, the last part of sixth thing. Thank you, I lost my place. Everything was created through Him and for Him. He existed before anything else and He holds all creation together. Christ is the head of the church, which is His body. He is the beginning, supreme over all who rise from the dead. So He is the first in everything. Say that again. He is the first in everything. For God in all His fullness was pleased to live in Christ, and through Him God reconciled everything to Himself. He made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means of Christ's blood on the cross. Whew, maybe you want to underline this one. This includes you. Wow. You were once far away from God. You were His enemies, separated from Him by your evil thoughts and accusations. Yet... Now you can put but in there too. Now He has reconciled you to Himself through the death of Christ in His physical body. As a result, He has brought you into His own presence. And you are holy and blameless as you stand before Him without one single fault. But you must continue to believe this truth and stand firmly in it. Don't drift away from the assurance you received when you heard the good news. The good news has been preached all over the world, and I, Paul, have been appointed as God's servant to proclaim it. I am glad when I suffer for you in my body, for I am participating in the sufferings of Christ that continue for His body, the church. God has given me the responsibility of serving His church by proclaiming His entire message to you. This message was kept secret for centuries and generations past, but now it has been revealed to God's people. So I remind you back to the Second Chronicles passage. This was secret to them, and yet they still worship God the way we, that we read about. 
Wow, how should we be worshiping God that gave His only Son to save us and redeemed us back and gave us this knowledge? Hmm. Verse 27, For God wanted them to know that the riches and glory of Christ are for you Gentiles also. And this is the secret. Underline this one too. Christ lives in you. This gives you assurance of sharing His glory. So, as a result of that, we tell others about Christ. Not just Paul, every believer. Warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that God has given us. We want to present them to God perfect in their relationship to Christ. That's why I work and struggle so hard, depending on Christ's mighty power that works within me. I want you to know how much I have agonized for you and for the church at Laodicea. That was their twin city. That was Sandpoint to Bonners Ferry, whatever it was. Closest thing in their region. And if you remember, Jesus wrote a letter to that church through John in the book of Revelation. And that letter, He warned that church. Paul wrote a letter to the Laodicean church. We'll find out in just a minute. We don't know what that letter said, but I have a feeling that it was similar to this letter, encouraging them. But Jesus' letter was not so encouraging. Basically, He said, You think you're rich. You think you're clothed, but you're blind, naked, and pitiful. This is to the church now, not to unbelievers. This is to the church. Because they haven't continued in their faith, growing in their love for one another. He says, you're neither hot nor cold, you're lukewarm. And because of that, I am, going, I am about to spew you out of my mouth, whatever that means. So let's remember that as we're reading this. Because he says again, I want you to know how much I have agonized for you and for the church of Laodicea, even though he's not been there. And for many other believers, this includes us again, who have never met me personally. Verse 2, I want them to be encouraged and to knit together by strong ties of, what's that word? Love. I want them to have complete confidence that they understand God's mysterious plan, which is Christ Himself. In Him lie hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I am telling you this... So no one will deceive you with well-crafted arguments. For though I am far away from you, my heart is with you. If you remember, we read from Thessalonians last week because these other people were telling the Thessalonians that God had already, Jesus had already come back and they had missed a second coming. So Paul writes this letter, the same thing. Don't be deceived. Read God's Word, whichever form you're reading it in. Study it. Devour it. Hunger and thirst for righteousness so that you can have love for one another and complete confidence. <clears throat> I am telling you this so no one will deceive you with well-crafted arguments. For though I am far away from you, my heart is with you, and I rejoice that you are living as you should, and that your faith in Christ is strong. And now, just as you accepted Christ Jesus as Lord, you must continue to follow Him. How? Let your roots grow down deep into Him and let your lives be built on Him. Then your faith will grow strong in the truth you were taught and you will overflow with thankfulness. Don't let anyone capture you with empty philosophies and high-sounding nonsense that comes from human thinking and from the spiritual powers, powers of this world rather than from Christ. For in Christ lives all the fullness of God in a human body. So you also are complete through your union with Christ, who is the head over every ruler and authority, everyone, even the unsaved. When you came to Christ, you were circumcised. Ah, that's, you got to read more to figure out what he means there. The Jews thought they were Jews because they had a symbol of circumcision. <laughs> he says, when you came to Christ, you were circumcised. Not the way you're thinking. Not by a physical procedure. Christ performed a spiritual circumcision the cutting away of your sinful nature. For you were buried with Christ when you were baptized, and with Him you were raised to new life, because you trusted the mighty power of God who raised Christ from the dead. Now, let me interject here. I heard so many believers say, oh, I've tried and tried and tried to stop this sin, including myself saying it, up to the point when I said, I can't do this pastor thing because of this sin. And what God spoke to me and what His Word clearly says is, you can't take away your sins. Jesus already did, though. Start living like it. Okay? You were dead because of your sins, because your sinful nature was not yet cut away. Then God made you alive with Christ. I backed up to verse 13. Okay? 
Verse 15, in this way he disarmed the spiritual rulers. Did I do 14? Okay, sorry. He canceled the record of the charges against us and took it away by nailing it on the cross. In this way he disarmed the spiritual rulers and authorities. He shamed them publicly by his victory over them on the cross. An instrument of uh, pain and suffering and ridicule is our instrument of glory. Wow. So don't let anyone condemn you for what you eat or drink or not for celebrating certain holy days or even or new moon celebrations or Sabbaths. That's one of the Ten Commandments. What is Paul thinking? But if you read it with the heart, you'll know that Jesus is Lord of the Sabbath. And if you honor Him on any given day, then you should well be able to honor Him every single day, presenting your body as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable under God, which is your reasonable and prudent and logical act of service. Okay? That's Romans 12.1. You read Romans 12.2 of how to do it. Okay? <clears throat> Verse 17, For these rules are only shadows of the reality yet to come, and Christ Himself is that reality. Don't let anyone condemn you by ins insisting on pious self-denial or the worship of angels, saying they have had visions about these things. Their sinful minds have made them proud, and they are not connected to Christ. What happens if you're not connected to Christ when you die? You plug in the answer. They are not connected to Christ, which is the head of the body, which is us, the church. For He holds the whole body together with its joints and ligaments, and it grows as God nourishes it told you to read Acts chapters 1 through 4. You'll see how that church grew. You, put your name in there, have died with Christ and He has set you free from the spiritual powers of this world. So why do you keep on following the rules of the world? See, there were still some in this church. There always will be. That's life. But you don't have to be. You can be different. You can want to be changed. I think that's a song we sang last week, right? I'm different today. Sorry. <laughs> Such as, don't handle, don't taste, don't touch. Such rules are merely human teachings about things that deteriorate as we use them. Things change. These rules may seem wise because they require strong devotion, pious self-denial, and severe bodily discipline, but they provide no help in conquering a person's evil desire. Since you have been raised to new life with Christ, set your sights on the realities of heaven. Don't seek to build treasures here on earth where moths uh, destroy and thieves, thieves steal. But set your sights on realities of heaven where Christ sits on place of honor at God's right hand. Think about the things of heaven, not the things of earth. For you died to this life and your life is hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is your life, is revealed to the whole world, you will share in all His glory. So, as a result of that, put together that's put to death the sinful earthly things lurking within you. Have nothing to do with sexual immorality, impurity, lust, and evil desires. Don't be greedy, for a greedy person is an idolater, wor worshiping the things of this world. Because of these sins, the anger of God is coming. Who used to do these things when you, you used to do these things when your life was still part of the world. But now is the time to get rid of whatever it is. You can fill in the blank. Anger, rage, malicious behavior, slander. That wasn't slander. That was just gossip. But gossip can become slander. I'm not going to Hawaii yet. Eventually, in God's grace, I'll go back. Okay? Maybe even take this shirt. I don't know. Because of these sins, God's anger is coming. You used to do these things when your life was still part of the world. But now is the time to get rid of anger, rage, mal malicious behavior, slander, dirty language. <sighs> Don't lie to each other. That's in there. For you have stripped off your old nature and all its wicked deeds. Put on your new nature and be renewed as you learn to know your Creator and, underline those words, become like Him. In this new life, it does not matter if you are Jew or Gentile, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbaric, uncivilized, slave or free. Christ is all that matters and He lives in all of us. Since God chose you to be a perfect, holy people, you must be clo clothe yourself with these things. Tender-hearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Make an allowance for each other's faults and forgive anyone who offends you. Remember, the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. Above all, clothe yourselves with what? Love. 
which binds, ties us all together in perfect harmony. And let the peace that comes from Christ rule in your hearts, for as members of one body you are called to live in peace and always be thankful. Let the message about Christ in all its richness fill your lives. Teach, teach and counsel each other with wisdom He gives. Sing psalms and hymns, two different kinds, <laughs> three, and spiritual songs to God with thankful hearts. And whatever you do or say, do as a representative of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through Him to God the Father. Now, here's some instructions for Christian households is what the NLT says. Wives, submit yourself to the husband. You should know these things. It's fitting to those who belong to the Lord. Husband loves your wives and never treat them harshly. Children, always... I got that one underlined. Sorry, Jacob. Obey your parents, for this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not aggravate your children. You probably got that one underlined. Or they will become discouraged. Slaves, obey your earthly masters. In everything you do, try to please them all the time, not just when they're watching you. Serve them sincerely because of your reverent fear of the Lord. Work willingly at whatever you do as, through, as though you were working for the Lord rather than for people. Remember that the Lord will give you an inheritance as your reward and that the master you are serving, master, not savior, master, the one who has rights and authorities owns you, the master you are serving is Christ. But if you do what is wrong, you will be paid back for the wrong you have done, for God has no favorites. Masters, be just and fair to your slaves. Remember that you always have a master in heaven. So do these things. Devote yourself to prayer with an alert mind and a thankful heart. Pray for us also that God will give us many opportunities to speak about His mysterious plan concerning Christ. That is why I am here in chains, in prison. So He could write these words to them. Pray that I will proclaim this message as clearly as I should. Live wisely among those who are not believers and make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversations be gracious and attractive so that you will have the right response to every, everyone. Then he has his final greetings, and I'm going to read them, but be care, don't blame me on the pronunciation of the people. And guess what? If you think you know how to pronounce them right, were you there? So don't blame me for pronouncing them wrong. Tychicus will give you a full report about how I'm getting along. He is a beloved brother and faithful helper who serves me in the Lord's work. I, won't, I have sent him to you for this very purpose, to let you know how we are doing and to encourage you. I'm also sending you Onesimus, a faithful and beloved brother, one of your own people. He and Tychicus will tell you everything that's happening here. Aristarchus, who is in prison with me, sends you his greetings, and so does Mark, Barnabas' cousin. As you were instructed before, Mark wel make Mark welcome if he comes your way. And if you don't know why that is, it's because Paul disassociated with Mark before and he's wanting to especially tell them, don't disassociate, we're fine. Don't treat people that way. We had a conflict of interest, that's all. Don't let it gossip and be more than that. Greet him. 11. Jesus, the one we call justice, also sends his greetings. These are the only Jewish believers among my co-workers. They are working with me here for the kingdom of God, and what a comfort they have been. Epaphras, a member of your own fellowship and servant of Christ Jesus, sends you his greetings. He always plays, prays earnestly for you, asking God to make you strong and perfect, fully confident that you are following the whole will of God. I can assure you that he prays hard for you and also for the believers in Laodicea and Heropolis. Luke, the beloved doctor, sends his greetings and so does Demas. Please give my greetings to our brothers and sisters at Laodicea and to Nympha and the, and the church that meets in their house. After you have read this letter, pass it on to the church at Laodicea so they can read it also and you should read the letter I wrote to them. And say to Archippus, be sure to carry out the ministry the Lord gave you. Be sure to carry out the ministry that the Lord gave you. Okay? Here is my greeting in my own handwriting, Paul. Remember my chains. May God's grace be with you. Now the good thing about me reading this letter is you can't say I'm too long because I read a letter to the church. And you kind of got to know when I'm finishing unless I go on somewhere else. But the reason that God put this upon my heart was because it's 2019, a time we look at new directions and, and things like that, and time we examine things we want to change. If this church is not growing in its love for one another, not obedience to the law, but in its love, then we're not fulfilling the two greatest commandments. To love the Lord our God with all our heart, mind, soul, and body, so that we will 
love one another. And that comes first from each and every one in here, different parts of the body that compromise the whole to make up the body of Christ to do His bidding in this world. Because that's the only reason that God has us still on this earth is to carry out the gifts of the Spirit, to love one another, to proclaim the Lord and Savior. Because see, when that's done, we go home. So we need to be putting that as a focus today. That's my challenge to you, reading that letter. You apply it to, to your hearts the way you want to. I want to be a church in 2019 and 2020 and 2021, however long we're here, that is growing in love for one another. That's my prayer today. Father in heaven, we do thank you and praise you. We thank you for Paul's words. We thank you for your word. We thank you that you are God, supreme, sovereign, and in control of all things. And everything you do is to bring you glory and honor. And that you will never forsake us or betray us, those who are bonded together with you, to you through Christ Jesus our Lord. Thank you for the Spirit coming to reside inside of us, making us a group of holy priests called out to this world to proclaim the message. Thank you for the Spirit that ties us together and teaches us. And we thank you also that Jesus is at your right hand being an advocate for us as well, saying, These are my brothers and sisters. We thank you and praise you and give you all glory and honor. Help us through the power of your Spirit to die to ourselves so that we can live for Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.